Yanni won't niche coon, eh? Squeeze, Diane, and the yo, will ya? Han, I'm me, I leave your ghost. You ne, huh? Unus, uni won't ne, he's. The guard, uni yaw, shale. Show why you know that's good, neo yaw, the garden. Show quon, okay. Wash, come on, niche, can't he? I shall know, gee, lu, walk, I. Wash a good one, you start an artist, get gee, lee, go he. Wash, you won't eat, you'll be no hectic. And that got stone, eh? Huh, he gave loose go. I know what's a licky, such a luck, good seal, no hecto. Go, go now, like. Acti, you know, wait, Hannah, we got a look gone. The way it's a doodle, say, no, it's the eye, got a look, we got a look gone. Turkey language was used, and it was all used in the games when I played back in the 50s and 60s. Uh, on both teams, both both sides, whether it's Bird Town or Wolf Town or Paint Town, we all spoke the Cherokee language, and we talked Cherokee in a ball game. Aniona, Kahogi, Nina. Sagutashi <laughs> They did speak in Cherokee, mostly all of them, way back when I was growing up. There weren't too many people that speak in English, just a few of them. And you'd go to the home, they all speak in Cherokee, everywhere you went. And now, you can't go nowhere, and they'd say, I don't know how to speak it. We were not allowed to speak our language in school. We were banned from it. As a that come from the federal government. They had their uh, ways of uh, punishing us if we spoke, if we were caught speaking the language. Growing up, I heard stories from my grandparents about the boarding school and, and the push for assimilation. Grandpa said he learned enough English in the first six months to keep from getting a whipping every day. And, uh, but they'd only use Cherokee at home. And he said, so it, it was traumatic for him. I'm not so sure that language was the only reason that the children were encouraged to speak English and not Cherokee. I think it probably had a lot to do with um, Americanizing the Cherokee children.
When we were growing up, when we were real young, that was all that was, they talked was the Cherokee language, very little English. Even my mother, she was, she had a hard time pronouncing a lot of English words. And she talked to us in the Cherokee language, but there was a bigger interest in the English because that's the way we were living. I remember in the early 60s, as a little girl, going to a community meeting, and there were some people that came from the government, the BIA, and came to our community meeting, and they were telling our parents how important it was that uh, their children learn English. It was going to better their lives, and they were going to be able to go to town and get a job. So I think because our parents wanted what was good for us or better things for us, they encouraged us to speak English. People would tell us, you know, you have to learn the white man's way, and, and that's even including the language, because they'd say, this is a white man's world, and you're going to be going out, and you're going to have to learn some of the things. Had they said, it's okay if you speak English, but you need to keep talking Cherokee, but they didn't. They just thought, well, it's the best thing for our kids, so they encouraged us to speak English. I think it's that time period that we started losing the language. Mine and Shirley's generation is probably the last, and I'll be 59 in October, and so will Shirley be 59 in November. And I think we're it. This would have been the heart of the Cherokee world. The Cherokee world kind of goes out from this place in almost a spider web or a wagon wheel kind of. And we know that this is so deep into the Cherokee world that it is unlikely that you would have had contact with other tribal people coming in here. So in essence, think of Gadua as Vatican City with Rome around it. So your, your trade, your international trade would have been at places like Kawi, Nkwasi, oh, just over those mountains right there. That's where you would have had, you know, all the languages you can imagine being spoken at. But here, this would have been purely Cherokee, purely Cherokee ceremonies taking place here, purely Cherokee stories taking place here. Traditionally, elders and storytellers tell us that Cherokees have been here since the beginning. The Creator put them here specifically. Archaeologically and anthropologically, we believe that Cherokees have been here for at least 12,000 years. A lot of these Cherokees that lived here lived in Kawi. And they had reservations, private reservations in 1819. And North Carolina came in and said, well, you made that treaty with the United States. You didn't make that treaty with you with North Carolina. So they forced them out. So imagine every five or 10 years, you've got to move and you've got to pack up whatever you can put on your back and you're leaving everything else at home, everything. That's what those Cherokees had to go through year after year after year after year. And you're still here. In the beginning, there were only, uh, I'll say 1,200. I hear a different number of how many people escaped the Trail of Tears removal. All those people spoke the Cherokee language in those days, 1,200 of them. And today we have 14,000 and only 200, I'll say 200, speak the language. I don't know whether uh, it might be more, it might be even less than 200 that speak the language.
I haven't heard the help me word today. Excuse day long. Excuse day long. Excuse day long. Ole star. Excuse day long. Yo. <laughs> There's a few fluent speakers, not too many, but those of us who can almost speak it, <laughs> try to incorporate it and use it more in our daily lives to preserve it. The spirit of getting together and working together on crafts brings out the desire to use the language. It just feels more natural. <laughs> we cannot teach the children during these next two weeks everything that there is to know about beadwork or basketry or river cane or white oak. But we also know that as with the corn beads, the most important thing is to plant the seed. And that's what we're doing. We're planting the seed of beadwork and, and basketry and uh, being able to share what little we know about the Cherokee language. We're, because just th during the first part of the week, Jim introduced the word ski stay long to them when they need help there to say ski stay long. And now they're using it frequently on their own. And whatever little bit we can help them and guide them with, that's what we're all about. Gada, Ganuteo, Hadiha, Tashega. We have this summer language camp that we do every summer, and it's for six weeks. They're here at 8 o'clock in the morning, just like going to school. So if they were just looking for something to do, they wouldn't be here. It's a little bit hard sometimes because you get new students every year. So that's why we're going back and we do the colors over, we do the numbers, and uh, the syllabary is just an ongoing thing. Because if the children who learn it one year, uh, you know, they're not going to read it the rest of the year maybe. So when they come back, they have to be refreshed. So, uh, and it's just a course to introduce them to the language. And perhaps and maybe, you know, what we pray is that they'll be so interested in it that they'll want to learn it. We know that the new generation that's coming up that's not learning Cherokee, they're kind of stuck in the middle. Part of them's native and part of them is trying to survive in this world. They have to play by everybody else's rules, you know, and try to live in a society that doesn't make sense to them. Because even if they can't speak the language, they still are hanging on to their culture, a piece of their culture as much as they can, but they don't understand it, you know? And to understand it, I think you've got to know the language. Right now, for some of the students in the community, some of the kids in the community, where they don't have that grounding in their own heritage language and heritage culture, you see them creating their own culture the only way that they can know how, uh, and that would be by rejecting the mainstream culture. And so they're not going to reject television and, and fast food, all that stuff is too fun. Uh, they're going to reject mainstream cultural institutions, and the only institution that they're really exposed to on a daily basis is the school system. And what we'd like to see more research on is the connection between uh, lifelong satisfaction and heritage language maintenance. Does having uh, your heritage language center you and settle you so that you're able to concentrate on, you know, academic success? No, you, uh, you ask it, it's going to tell you, are we are young? <laughs> Yeah.
you know, it's it's interesting that we if we look around the world, there are about seven to eight thousand distinct languages, but something like thirty to fifty languages per year go extinct. So we're losing our linguistic diversity at a really alarming rate. And what will happen is that if when you imagine two large language communities living next door to each other, one of those languages is continually sort of out competing the other. So at every exchange in a local shop, someone's got to agree to speak the other language. Simply because English has such an enormous head start, one would have to bet on English being the language that's going to be the sort of, you know, this is a terrible sort of metaphor, the lingua franca for the world. If our language dies, it's gone forever. And a lot of people says, well, our Indian language is not the first language in the United States. English is now. And, we, and if we let English take over, then our language will die. It's not just about the language, it's who we are and what we believe in and how we live every moment of our lives. Until we get back into understanding what the language means to us, we're always going to be kind of lost just wandering around out there, not understanding where we're going or where we came from or, or where our place in life is, you know, in this society, even in America, even though we've always been here. Azegadua Zunadelo Guasti Nugadua Academy is a total immersion program. We start with infants and then we go all the way up to five year olds. And then we go into elementary and we have roughly 40 students that are in kindergarten through third grade. And as that oldest cohort progresses, we add a grade each year. So those ones that have stayed with us and blazed the trail, they're the third graders now. So we're adding fourth grade next year, fifth grade the year after that, and then they will be ready to go to male school wherever they may choose to go. <laughs> Language revitalization has come about from different corners of Cherokee. Uh, there are different approaches to it, and there still are. The immersion program was probably the largest consolidated effort. It required significant resources, significant support for its continuation, and, and that's a message to the community that this is important. I think it's fascinating to see this kind of process happening. This hasn't been done uh, very much, what the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians is doing here. What you have in the Cherokee language is this very strong feeling that the language is a central component of, of who Cherokee people have been, and that there's an obligation on the, on the current generations, the living generations, to to maintain that commitment to the past and to continue to uh, speak the language in their homes and in their community and in their institutions.
Well, it's not that we want to be different. We are different. And it doesn't mean that, you know, we can't all live in harmony, you know, in, in the states here. But, you know, again, it goes back to our language and our culture and, and, our, and our traditions, you know. We're, uh, we're unique people, and that's okay. The United States is about being diversified. Long ago in a small town called Cherokee lived a girl named Summer and a boy they called Zali. It says imagination is more important than knowledge. Sequoia had that imagination. He had that vision. To me, he's a Einstein. <laughs> His Cherokee name was Sequoia. His work was destroyed by some of the community people, even his wife. He went back and started all over again, and it was a great thing, it was a great invention because it's helped us to preserve the language. It is a syllabary uh, because uh, the uh, characters in most cases approximate a syllable. So, ga, uh, ka, ge, gi, go, gu, go. It's very interesting from the perspective of the fact that uh, you would have literally thousands of years, say, for the writing of European languages where you would go from writing it to printing it. And so, but for this language, uh, he finished his work on the, the writing system in 1821, if I remember correctly. And then 1828, you have the first printed form of it in the Cherokee Phoenix newspaper. So we'll see what we get here. This will be approved. And in fact, that is the second iteration of the writing system. The original one that um, Sequoia developed was much more calligraphic. And so they converted it rather fast from this original calligraphic writing system to one uh, which uh, does look like Roman letters in a lot of cases. It was said to have been quickly uh, taken uh, the, uh, and used, and then the, the paper started printing in, in 1828. The first editor, Elias Boudelant, was very intent on uh, promoting uh, the need for uh, the Cherokee to stay in what is now the eastern United States. And you see that move to a place where he eventually signed the final treaty removal and uh, lost his life because of it. Uh, so um, um, the newspaper sort of is a microcosm of the pressures that you see um, one group of people uh, living under uh, while they're trying to deal with the loss, essentially, of their country, their home. Pops out? Mm -hmm. 
There's a big drop one and there's a bunch of them. Who are the little people? Let's So Tuesday we went to Hickory Tree Gap. It's an old, very old cemetery. We did find a couple of tombstones that had the syllabary. Over in Cherokee, on the Kuala boundary, they don't use this line. They don't use this line. And then over here in Stoberg, sometimes they use it and sometimes they don't. So what's a good word with clay? Clay stee, clay stee. And then over in Cherokee, they would always say, they would never say clay stee, they'd also say chase stee, chase stee. It's so easy to learn the syllabary. Look at all the symbols in the world that you've memorized, like the Nike check. You see a Nike check, you know what it stands for. Uh, you see that peace sign, it stands for peace, you know. All these symbols that you learn, don't even know you're learning them. Well, Cherokee is the same way as far as reading and writing. You're just learning the symbol, the alphabet. You learn those, you know, it's a breeze. So that's the easy part of Cherokee. I talked to a linguist one time from Georgia she said, Cherokee is the hardest language I've ever tried to learn. I said, well, then it doesn't make me feel bad when I am struggling with my students and wondering why it's taking them so long to learn to speak. And she said, yes, it is so hard to learn. The Cherokee language is also completely different from any European language. So none of our students start out with a kind of head start with cognates in the language or similar structures in the language. And sometimes it's surprising to people in the community also that that they have to come at their language now from an English language perspective. If they haven't grown up exposed to a lot of language in their home, then Cherokee language is just completely new and to me very exciting and, and uh, quite a challenge, but to other people very frustrating. There is no word for word translation. One word could be a noun, adverb, adjective, just depending on how you say it in a sentence. You can take a Cherokee word and you can change a form sometimes hundreds of ways and it changes the meaning of that word. If we say go get something, if you're going to go get a glass of water, a liquid, it's different. Go get changes. Liquid is built into the go get. If you're going to go get a flexible item, like a shirt, it's flexible. The flexible is built into the word go get. If you're going to go get a solid object, the solid form is built into go get. Or go get a long and unbendable, like a fishing pole or pencil. If you're going to go get an animate object, something that's alive, a chicken. Go get the cat, go get the dog, go get changes. So that's the hard part of teaching learners when they're older. Cherokee is still a little more like detailed, so we would say we, but instead of saying like me and you and them, her, it could be just us two and then not that person, or it could be all three of us. And so you have the whole uh, sentence like, uh, I should go dancing, say, would be a single word in Cherokee language and that's difficult for our students sometimes to understand. Reported past and definite past. I definitely went, or I must have went. And I know you can do that in English but I just, because I just did it. But in Cherokee, it's just it's a small little t. It was our first language. That was the language we were taught at home and uh, it wasn't hard to learn. 
So nowadays it's easy, it's harder for the students to learn because it's not their first language. It's not the first thing they hear. It is a very difficult language to learn. And thank God, I, it's my first language. I would have, I could never learn it. I think that we are getting to the children at the right time, and that is birth on. These little ones is where the turnaround is going to begin. They are going to take the language and the culture that they're learning now and pass it on to their children. <laughs> Some people think that we just sit and talk Cherokee to the children. They think all they're learning is Cherokee. What they don't understand is that they're learn learning science, social studies, language arts, mathematics, spelling, you name it. We're, they're learning all those content areas that English speaking schools are, but it is in the Cherokee language. One of the things I really want people to understand is these children are bilingual. They're not monolingual. They don't only speak English. They don't only speak Cherokee. And I want people to understand that they will be able to, to, to walk in both worlds. They'll be able to understand Cherokee, they'll be able to understand English, and they'll be able to, to succeed in both worlds. It's not like they're going home and not hearing the English language, or when they go to town, when they go to Walmart or wherever, they're hearing the English language all the time. It's just like the Cherokee language was when we were growing up. It's just, it's just, you know, flipped over. I'm very thankful for all my teachers. It's a great staff to work with and they work together well. And, and I know it's difficult for them because they are having, we can't just go on the internet and find a worksheet on the life cycle of a butterfly or whatever you have to, it has it could be found on the internet then it has to be translated um, so it is difficult I can't imagine having to come up with a lesson plan that I needed that day sometimes I you might need something right then in in a regular English school you can just go print it out and it's there in Cherokee there's no books out there so we're uh, making it up as we go so even in our immersion schools we have to just try to beat the clock and try to keep it with the grades because it requires a lot of translation. We spend a lot of our time working with uh, speakers to develop the curriculum and materials for the gradual presentation of the language to the students so that they always feel comfortable in the language and that they're always learning a little bit more of the language as they move along. <laughs> These are all original books with native writers and native artists. And uh, we do, these were just first grade readers here. But, you know, we didn't have words for modem and <laughs> just, just basic plugins, keyboard. I have to go to the speakers and I say, well, what would you say for this? 
And then they described to me, well, what does it do? I like this one, it says, Anagalishki unajit. That means uh, electric brain. Once you start learning the language, it branches out to all other areas, history, culture, traditions. When they're learning the language, they're learning, you know, everything about the Cherokee people as well. When you are learning the language, you learn, for example, Degwena Shanti. And that's a way to say where I'm from. I am from such and such place. But in the nuances of the language, what you're really saying is my fire is at such and such. My council house is there. I am a Cherokee of where this council fire is. And, you know, if you ask a person, a Cherokee person, you know, what do you call yourself as a tribal person? They would, they would say they're Cherokee maybe, but Cherokee is not a Cherokee word. It, it has no meaning in the Cherokee language. It's something that was applied, a name that was applied to the Cherokee people. You would hear Ani Yunwia, which means the real people or the principal people, or you might hear Ani Gadua Gi. So you're literally saying, I am a person of Gadua, of this place. My grandpa used to say Shkwatosta to me like this, and he would maybe have a knife, you know, and pull it away from me. And I thought he was saying for the longest time, give it to me, you know. So I thought he was teasing me. And um, I didn't, and I just I took it as the meaning of that word. And then later on, uh, I understood that, I found that word meant, lend me this. He was saying, lend me this, you know. And um, it was much more polite. There's words in Cherokee that are just so specific. The word do you really can't be translated into English because there's so many things that encompass this, but it's one of the cornerstones of our program. And like the closest translation would be the right path, the right way. But there's so many components that that, com that that encompasses that we can't, you know, just can't give them a word in English. The yukta, that's a, that's a powerful word. It's hard to explain. Some people say it just means straight. But to me it means so much more. It means it's the way of being in the right way. It's, it carries, there. I can't even think of how to put that into words. Within the language are values and traditions and history and ways of life. That's what speaking Cherokee is about. And so without that, we lose all of that. We don't just lose something that's very difficult or, or that's something that, oh, the, you know, our elderly people speak Cherokee. We lose who really the heart and soul of who we are as Cherokee people. This is what is so critical and so important to our identity and our future as a people, is to continue on making the same sound that was given to us by the Creator, our language. It's a sound that hasn't been heard here for 60 years, the sound of children speaking our language. Then in the God, I go down, the daily grass, um, all day, Gidua. If we go some places and we start to uh, see our friends or something, we usually like go up and speak Cherokee sometimes. And then, like, when you look around, people are just like, wow.
my son, he, we actually ran into his uncle at Family Dollar, I mean, just the store, and him and his wife was talking in the language. We're talking about a goose, but they were referring to it as a duck, and it was on the top shelf, and the uncle was sitting there calling it a kuanu, and here Yon was, he was probably about three or four at the time, and he's like, Hadi, Shasha. And the uncle turned around and he looked, he looked back at his wife, he looked back at Yon, he's like, do you speak Cherokee? But he was talking to him in Cherokee the, this whole time. And he's like, uh-huh. And his wife standing back and her, her eyes teared up and my eyes teared up. And it, I mean, it's just, my son could have a conversation with two of our oldest fluent speakers and know what they're talking about and respond in the language. And seeing not only him, but other kids speaking our native language. And it's just, it's amazing. It just touches my heart. I like Cherokee because it's very rare. And um, like a lot of people think, think that it's just a language. But like if you're Cherokee, it's like you're home. This total immersion program is not a school, it's a home. And so from the very foundation and the, the design and everything that we put into it is that we are not, we are not peers. Your classmates are not classmates. We are a family. Your classmates are not just your friends. They're equivalent to cousins and brothers and sisters. It wears on and tugs on your heart every single day. There are moments of joy when you walk into the classroom, when you hear the baby speaking and understanding the language, and you're running on the playground, and they're, um, they're speaking Cherokee and walking into the cafeteria, and they're playing rock, paper, scissors, but they're doing it in Cherokee and you sit down with pencil and paper and you're trying to figure out how you can keep this going in it's it's rough work it's it's hard so you have to surround yourself by dedicated people who feel the same way about the language as you do we can look at the look at the newspaper every week as it comes out and we circle the names of the people that we lost that are fluent speakers, and we look at how we're gonna be able to survive in the next five years so that this program and this language doesn't die. Because if we shut our doors, the language will just become a list of vocabulary words that are taught at, from dictionaries. I got a no dini of Loxian, they lack one. Skin as a luck. I sent some kilos of sin, then you name, you nego was on Tungi, Undo Gunus and Ale, Ego Hid, Gianas Nigune. They're hearing the language all the time, um, and they're reading and writing it. But uh, when they leave here, it's hard for them to continue to do that because their parents are not bilingual. It makes it hard for the child to, to continue. The thing is, it's almost, we're running out of time. We're, because we're running, we're losing too many speakers. Thinking about the number of native uh, speakers uh, who are fluent, um, it's a rather sobering circumstance to think about a language in that situation. There are many languages uh, around the world that are facing the same circumstance. <laughs>
Ulfnegit no alehti hikta katangisko akitodge sanukstana gumeska tehan hikesti ego hitski katangisko tehan hikesti hagos ho gehost stai no gostan herle de de ki wejle hikta lehu ha da ki wej hits nus go ego hida ki wej ya kwelis katangisko lacha ko win stan gumeska the hun he gets to go out this going to eat. Skin ha, skin on her, got tongue is go. You wet skin on. I send a do you, do you know get her, get on it, how want this to go. Skin on, I send a get dog, got tongue is go, you wet skin of the go. Nagadi, they want it, they don't go free home school. God do Louis, they don't lead on her. She lucky did good tickets, clothes, do walk out, scale it, go away. Then you all know the squid does no hating. Then they lock out yen. Galone yen, egain, egain, nailish, can I hear, eggy won't he skate home? I get it scum. Get you do it, eggy, your hush shetty, I shouldn't have started, eggy looks don't get haste. You know, some people says, well, you know, it's your generation, Lou. You know, after you're gone, it's not going to be uh, alive. But uh, I think I'm making a harder effort knowing that if it's going to die with me, then I need to do something to preserve it. And so uh, I keep talking to these kids and some of the high school kids that's been in Shirley's class. If I drive through McDonald's, there's a boy there and I, I start talking to him in Cherokee and he'll think about it. And, he says he has to think about it, but some of the words comes back. So I think that's how you, you know, preserve your language. I know that you are also going to be in the U.S. There's a good thing. You know, 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 Shakona gay, giggle gay, scholar, gunny gay, gunny gay, scholar, away the odds, a odd alone gay, the lone again. Oh, stop, oh, stop, don't go. Keep talking to your kids, your grandkids, and that's the only way we're going to get it done. You have to have the whole community support, the majority of the people realizing, you know, how important it is. I have a hard time sometimes because I live in this, this world, but one thing that I, I know is I'm, I live on this Indian. Uh, land, and I have all the benefits of being a Cherokee, not just because I live here, but because that blood flows through me. I have a responsibility to, to walk both worlds. If I don't have my culture to ground me, then I really don't belong here. There has to be an understanding and a value, and the community has to embrace the idea that Cherokee language is what makes us Cherokee that having an enrollment card doesn't make you Cherokee. It just makes you a number within a government, within a government. And you'll hear that in this work quite a bit. Oh, you can't be this kind of person unless you speak this language. And the problem with that is languages can be so difficult to hang on to um, that you're saying that your own children even are not your own people and so I, I think that rhetoric is a little bit too harsh um, but definitely that would be one of the major drives for learning the Cherokee language is, is your kind of sense of Cherokee heritage and uh, the language as who you are or, or who you want to be you know I'd like to think about it more aspirationally so learning the Cherokee language now would be to say that you're a part of the Cherokee community and it's a beautiful community. If we consider what it actually means to be a pluralistic society, then that means we're going to have to make space for people who 
uh, speak different languages, who think different ways, who, who have different cultures inside of uh, a national culture or a global culture. And so all the movement has been in the opposite direction towards globalization, towards homogenization, you know. What does it mean to, to change the uh, process and open up space for a plurality of different small cultures working together? How can we truly accept and respect those people and allow them some uh, measure of autonomy with their educational system and the language that they speak? Yesterday I was walking around, it was Children's Day, and I saw so many young people have these tattoos. And they have the syllabary writing on them, and I was like amazed. I feel proud that they have, are willing to, to celebrate their nativeness, their Cherokee self with that. You know, but I, I would hope that, I don't want people just to put syllabary in, on their bodies. I want syllabary, not syllabary, I want the Cherokee language to come out of their mouths. I want them to learn how to speak. I want them to, to celebrate our culture by keeping our language alive. My girls go to New Gadua. I know that they're learning their, their language and they're learning their culture and you know I'm stick I'm staking their their futures that they are going to be okay and that they're going to be okay in the culture and that the culture is going to take care of them and they're going to be educated there and so I don't know where it's going to go but I think we're moving in a good direction. I resent the word now when I hear someone say it's dying or it's a dead language because it isn't. It's very much still out there. I think that we can turn that around and really turn it around by saying we're speaking it. The children are speaking it. It's alive. Everyone wants to see how our children are going to balance two languages and still be successful in education with the English-speaking world. There's a lot on these kids' shoulders that a lot of people don't really realize. In English, that's not my language. I speak it, but it's not mine. If I speak in Cherokee, it's coming from the heart, because that's mine. That's my language.